Welcome to Piano Keys Academy. I am Dr. Michael Finley, and this is the first part of my three-part series all about arm impulses. You know, every single school of piano technique that I've ever studied has some version of the principle that the fingers should never work by themselves, but as part of a holistic coordinated system that includes the hand, the arm, and indeed the rest of the body. In other words, they're the end point of a kinetic chain that begins at the center of the body, continues through the upper extremity, and the fingers are just the last link in that chain. So you should never separate the movements of the fingers from the rest of the body, but instead you need to coordinate the movements of the fingers with the rest of the body. So what we need is some way to systematically implement this idea. Enter arm impulses, which are one of the most powerful practice techniques I know of. As I said, every technical approach I've been exposed to has its own version of this idea, so I thought I'd compare the three that I use the most as a way to demonstrate that different successful approaches to technique can approach the same idea from three different angles. In this series of videos, we will look at downward arm impulses, as taught by many Russian school teachers single and double rotations is taught in the Taubman approach, and forward impulses is taught by my brilliant teacher, Mark Durand, and his disciples. Let's get started. So in this first video of my arm impulse series, I wanna talk about what I call Russian arm impulses. The Russian school of piano playing emphasizes what they call intoning at the piano while engaging the entire arm, resulting in a beautiful singing sound and great physical freedom at the instrument. Students are taught to practice with downward impulses with a follow through. So before I get into how to perform these properly, I wanna talk a little bit about the anatomy of the shoulder. So the shoulder is actually the intersection of three different bones. You've got the humerus, the clavicle or collarbone, and the scapula or shoulder blade. So a critical thing to understand is that the shoulder is not actually a single joint, but three. So you've got the sternoclavicular joint here where the clavicle articulates with the sternum. You've got the acromioclavicular joint where the clavicle meets up with the front part of the scapula. And then you've got the glenohumeral joint where the humerus fits into a little concave area of the scapula. The scapula is held in place by muscles, so there's no bony joint in the back, but this area is sometimes referred to as the scapulothoracic joint. So the crucial takeaway here is that the scapula and clavicle are part of the arm. Most people mismap the arm as ending here, but it actually ends here and here. The one and only bony attachment of the arm to the axial skeleton, or torso, is here underneath the Adam's apple where the clavicle meets the sternum. So if you have a problem with stiff shoulders, often the answer is actually to relax your chest. So the pecs often get a little tight. If you think about it, so much of our lives take place in front of our bodies. Think of smartphones, think of computers, and even at the piano, we tend to look at our hands, we round our shoulders, and we keep our head down. So a very common source of tension is just that, just the rounding of the shoulders. Also, another source is forward head position. When we tip our head forward, maybe to look down at our hands, the muscles of the upper back take up the slack, and that restricts the mobility of the scapula. So think of doing the opposite. Open up the chest and keep your head up and notice how your shoulders feel. I'll bet if you have a problem with tense shoulders that tend to go up, you'll find that just opening up the chest and keeping the head up makes a big part of the difference. So experiment with that. So what all of this accomplishes, uh, so what relaxing the shoulder girdle does is uh, it gives you access to the weight of the entire arm including the upper arm, and even this part of the arm here. So, if you release the weight of that entire assembly into the keyboard, so I'm just letting gravity, I'm letting the gravity of this whole assembly sink into the key. And notice, also, I'm going down, but I'm also following through. I absorb the sound and I never force to the bottom of the key. Because that would, if I force to the bottom of the key, 
Um, I bet you can tell even through my phone microphone that that results in a bad sound, right? Um, if you aim your power at the bottom of the key, it's physically taxing and you have less control over the sound and the sound that you do get tends to be harsh. I'll do a whole video about the uh, mechanism of the piano and why it's bad to force to the bottom of the key, but for now, just know that whenever you perform with any of these kinds of arm impulses, you need to absorb the sound, keep your ears on, and then follow through. I like to follow through forward because it takes me out of the instrument and prepares me for the next note. So this is very closely related to another kind of arm impulse I'll talk about in the third video of this series, which are forward impulses from the elbow. So that's where you just go straight forward from the elbow and I'll cover that in detail. The two are a little bit different and they accomplish different things in my opinion, so that's why I want to cover both. So these Russian downward impulses are great for a few things. First of all, it teaches you how to properly map the arm and shoulder joints and free up any shoulder tension so that you take full advantage of the weight of the entire arm. And second, it helps you organize and center your hand behind the finger that is playing. It lines up the bones of the hand so that the finger plays its note with the full support of the structures behind it. The absorption and follow-through components teach you how to be sensitive to the mechanism of the piano and to develop a rich singing sound at the piano rather than a harsh forced sound. So that's it for the first video. Stay tuned for the second and third installments and until next time, happy practicing.